So today on the Tim Marner podcast show, we've got my mate, Matt Greenhouse. You're going to hate this bit. <laughs> BAFTA award winning screenwriter, filmmaker, best known for films Control, Nowhere Boy, and Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool. Yeah, and the pornographic one. No, we're not talking about that one. That's just between <laughs> me and you. Matt, appreciate this, mate. Really appreciate it. It's been a long time coming on it. Well, yeah, you know, we've been trying to get this going for a couple of years now. The yeah. COVID, it's everything, but yeah. we, we got here in the end on memories of. Uh, Bolton and, and Tim Marner. So, I've been to your house, I've been to your moved. study. We've moved now. But I've been to the house and they've like, the writing's on the wall everywhere. Yeah. Talk to me about your creative writing right. process. Because I feel a lot of people will get value from this. They might think you're a little bit mental from the way your brain works, but yeah. talk me through your process for writing. I think with, with everything, I always end up with things on the wall because I just like sitting and staring at things. And you know, when you have a, when you can sit and stare at a beautiful view and you just get lost in it. I think that's the same with, with my stories. And once I get a certain amount of structure or, or, or an understanding of the, the narrative of it, I kind of throw it up on a wall and stare at it for weeks <laughs> and through that just 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 letting it sort of infiltrate your brain somehow uh it it, it starts to formulate into a structure that i want to see so you start off with research i just get all the stuff from the internet sh shove it on the wall okay what's the story what's the story it's like you know you're looking at some kind of big puzzle hmm. And then suddenly, after you stare at something, it's like when you look when you look at a puzzle for for that long, or you or you, you look at a jigsaw for that long. You walk away from a jigsaw, you come back to a jigsaw. The pieces start in the end; they start fitting. And that and that is 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 kind of my approach of of why things are on the wall, because in the same way as a jigsaw is always on the table, you always come back to it. If it's locked away in a laptop or a computer. Or a book, even, you know, it's very easy to turn the telly on instead. But when it's in your face and it's something that you're drawn to, like a good view, especially if it's your own inner workings of the brain, then I always find that that's the best way to go. So plenty of wall space wherever I live. <laughs> so talk, talk me through Nowhere Boy. Yeah. So obviously somebody approached you to do Nowhere Boy. Out, so so that, what, what do you what do you do from there? That came after Control. So Control did really well at Cannes, and it was like the breakout film, yeah. the, the Joy Division film. Um, what was that called? It was Jack. It, it, was it, it, it was Ian Curtis. Really. Ian, Cur right, Ian yeah, Curtis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But who played him? Um, it was a guy called Sam. Oh God, he's going to kill me. We have to we'll have to re-edit that bit. <laughs> <laughs> He, he was an unknown. He was in a band in Leeds. Right. And Anton Corbijn, who's the big, you know, Depeche Mode director yeah. and U2 promos, that was his first, that was his first film. And he, Sam Riley. Sorry, Sam. You're not going to listen to Sorry, Sam. He ain't going to listen to this. He's, he's, he's not a subscriber. <laughs> no. Uh, so he found, he was looking for people that could play and act, but because they didn't have any money, they couldn't really go to an A-lister. Um, so he went scouting and because he knows bands, uh, he's, been, he's been hanging around with them. This is Anton. He, he found Sam who had already, he was in a sort of middling to failing band in Leeds, Indies. So he knew his way around the stage, but he, you know, he, he wasn't really going anywhere. So this opportunity arrived and he, he, he took it with both hands. He also looked like he had, which helped. Uh, but the performance that Anton and he got together and and and, and was able to materialise for that film is what made it. Were you a fan anyway? No, I wasn't, and the, not not because it, uh, I I put Joy Division on and, and rejected them. It's because I was quite kind of ignorant to to that era of music because that was sort of late seventies and into early eighties, and then I I mean I was a New Order fan. A new order, you know, took me from Blue Monday into the Hacienda, and, and I was 
I was with them all the way, technique and all that. So Joy Division was not, I wasn't a fan because I disliked the music. I wasn't a fan because I was ignorant to, to what to what they had put out. And then the education that I was allowed to have by researching that movie just totally changed everything. And, you know, I, I find it, I'd love to listen to their music, but I also find it very difficult as well right now because you know when I was it, it was a big film for me to to write and to to go to those dark places where Ian when I had to go there as well so talk me let's do control, control then so obviously somebody approaches you to do it how does somebody come to approach you to yeah so it, it turned out Debbie his wife and his his daughter Natalie yeah. Curtis they they'd already been working on a script with somebody else it seems like I always pick up sloppy seconds but uh, <laughs> which is Probably a story we can go yeah, back yeah, there yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a case of they had been talking to these American guys um, who were fans of the band and who were trying to say they were produce, film producers. There was a script out, apparently it was uh, a fan that wrote it and he was American. And um, Debbie hated the script. So in the same way that we were just talking about Sam hating the other script we can't, can't talk about, suddenly they the idea was to find a Mancunian writer. I'd just come out of TV, I'd written Burn It, which was like a, the first thing in the, the early 2000s for BBC Three, and I'd written an episode of Cold Feet. Yeah. I was just starting out on my career, as it, as, it, as it was, and you know with the clocking off as well. And then 24 hour party people came out and I was just so jealous because I should have written that. Yeah, that's right, the Australian. I should have written it, yeah, I mean, yeah, it would have been, I mean, you know, Frank Cottrell Boyce is a fantastic writer and, you know, in the end, it's a it's a funny film, but it would have been 20 times funnier and, and more brilliant if I did it. Sorry, Frank, if you're listening to this. <laughs> but but then it then it became a case of, all right, if there's something else about, you know, the Godfathers of music in our town, then I wanted to do it. Yeah. So I heard about it on the ether that they, that they wanted to find a Mancunian writer. I had a really good agent, and it's still the same agent that I've got. I said, find out who's doing it, put me in the game, because that's, I'd prefer to write that than Cold Feet. You know, that that's where I want, you know, want to be. They found out who they were. I sat down with Debbie, the producer, Orion, who's from Texas, um, and Natalie. We got on, they read Burn It. They understood I had a Mancunian voice that would probably transfer quite well into into the world, which they were were probably lacking in that first script, and uh, yeah, we went ahead. You were, and and really, there was no structure there that that I was told to do. I hadn't read the old script. So coming back, coming back to the thing of it again, yeah, then, so are they are they giving you the script that they kind of already done? And then you're going to your boards and you're writing the stuff up there, or are you? What, no, no, didn't you, give me the so script. You're doing research first on him. So, so Debbie's written a book. So Debbie wrote a book called "Touching from a Distance," which was about her relationship with Ian and you know how that manifested from when they were at school to how it all you know imploded and ending with his you know with his suicide. So it was a really, really touching, moving book, well written obviously from the heart you know so as a, as a sort of text or a blueprint that you can jump off it was brilliant for me because i was just in there i mean it was it was a really emotive uh way to start so you start with that i get the book they decide to say okay matt go and write the script i get the book i then go in the book and what i do then is i highlight everything in that book that I feel is of interest. I don't think about the structure of the story. I don't feel like what I am going to do later. So this is how the adaptations work. And then I, I highlight everything, and even to the words, right? Even to one word that I think works for me. And then what happens after that is then I transcribe those highlights with longhand into a pad because you write them out again and suddenly you find that it gets further and further into your DNA. Right, and then I then and that's when I start. Once I get it onto a pad in longhand, I then stick that longhand onto the wall. But I do that probably not with just one book. I probably do it with about five key books, right? Uh, so all this information, 
that I feel now that it's part of me because I've rewritten it out. Because re you know, it's like when you've got a spelling test. You get a spelling test wrong when you were a kid and you, you got the spelling wrong. You yeah. had to write it out 10 times, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, 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 and that's yeah. how you learn things. So writing, writing it out again and then sticking it on the wall. Has somebody told you how to do this? Or no. is this the Matt Greenhouse way? Absolutely no one's taught me anything about anything. Right. I mean, the, the, just just going back from then, the way I learned about scripts was, you know, I became the first T-boy on Hollyoaks by fluke. And then I started working with scripts through that because you had to learn how to break down a script in order to be able to, you know, to make it happen. So the practical side of shooting a script is how I first came into the industry. Um, but as far as writing a script, and no one's taught me anything. It just, I just got to a point where I thought, I, I used to write nightclub reviews. Um, I, I, I just married them together and I thought, I can do this. So I mean, it was like the Ramblers and Madman, on it? When you walk into your stu uh, studio, yeah. like it was the thought. Only I, I, I just I I know we've talked about it before, but I was really interested in your thought process, how your brain works, mm. um, and doing that. But when you're looking at that board, it's only me that can decipher that. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's just like I'm looking at that thinking, is, is this guy all right? No, I'm not right. No, I'm not at all. <laughs> And I'm actually I, on the on the spectrum, totally. But that, you come to terms. So with that. that one there is. I mean, have you ever thought that you your brain works like ADHD? Have you got? Have you? Do you think you're on the sort of spectrum of that? I think so. I think it's how you going back to that jigsaw. It's, it's how you piece things together. Yeah. You know, within you know, the capacity of your own brain, and everyone does it differently. And I think it works for me. I think, you know, being a writer works for me and being able to structure stories or see things happen in the future, you know, it's, it, it, you know, and constantly sort of have visions of how things interact in the future yeah. or in fantasy land works for my brain. And when you're a writer and you can actually structure your own way of doing it, and yeah. you, it feels very creative. Because you, you you know you haven't really got anyone telling you how, how it should be done. Yeah. Is there's no sort of right or wrong way. Yeah. I know it's my way, and I feel very much they call it the flow, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And um, when I get into that situation, and it's not easy to get in the flow because sometimes you you kick against it because it takes a lot of concentration yeah. in order to be able to slow everything down, and it's not easy then you know just sort of like lighting a fag or something like that or having a drink. It's difficult to get in the club, but once you're in it, it's the best place ever. And what is it? So you're doing your long gowns, you've got it on the board, obviously you're looking at deciphering it. Yeah. Do you know when you're going to get into that flow? Or do you set yourself when you've done like yoga fitness before where you kind of look, or does it just kind of come? There's two, the two sides to the flow. One, one is the structural flow is when you're trying to sort of piece it together as, as how it would work as a movie yeah. or even as a TV series. There's that that side, which is very much the jigsaw side of the flow. And then there's the other side, which is the writing flow, where, you know, you're actually sat there writing the scenes and, you know, it's just coming. It, it's just happening. And you just feel, you know, you, you could be there 10 minutes or, you know, you could be there feeling it's 10 minutes, but you've been there sort of like two hours. Yeah. And that happens, but that is only, you know, it, it, that isn't instantaneous. Yeah. You know, that takes a lot of all, all that imbibing, all everything you're doing, everything's working up to that moment within the writing because yeah. that's the apex, that's where you've got to be. You know, that's what, that's your money, that's your money earner. Yeah, yeah. So is when you're writing like that. And that's also when you, when it feels good because everything that you've been researching and everything that you've been uh trying to get into your head in order to write that script is coming out and some people it doesn't happen and sometimes some days it doesn't happen as yeah. well you know hey i'm, I'm you know what because my, my brain's like that mate and i kind of like i wondered how yours works structurally because obviously i'll kind of i don't do it to your level where you got it on the board because my brain has worked like that but I'll do research and let it kind of sink in and then I'll go for a bit of a walk and then in my own head I'm sort of piecing it together. So sometimes I'm walking dog and I get here, I, there's just something that happens. Is There's an hour and a half flow that I've got 
where it just feels like I'm not doing anything, mm. but I've got to put myself in that situation. But I just wondered how your creative process works, because that's what really interests me about your brain. Well, I think how walking you... as well. I mean, walking, especially if it's a gentle walk, n- yeah. not necessarily, I mean, I've had good ideas on runs as well, but gentle walking is, is, is brilliant for ideas, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and, you know, coming out of that, because that inner, inner monologue, that inner voice is so important. Yeah to to kind of listen to and to be able to go on a solo walk and yeah. talk to yourself yeah. <laughs> like like crazy but i've been around here in bolton when you say like riverton with a with a tape record you know and, and going on a walk and it's and, and just the ideas come and that's how long yeah. ago it was it was a tape recorder it wasn't even an iphone and uh you know the, i think that gentle movement or acceleration of heartbeat yeah. does help so that it doesn't surprise me that you get a, a buzz yeah. or you get a creative. Well, I, I did a bit of research into it and I was just like, I wondered why when I'm walking that most of my ideas come there. And they say um, your cars are like your second heart. So when you actually get your cars pumping, it pushes blood back up to your head so you can actually be able to think a bit better. Yeah. Which I thought was really interesting. Obviously, like moving forward and stuff helps me think forward as well. Yeah. Um, but. I was I was yeah. reading something about also sort of like judges who give him parole and all that and it, and also meal times work as well and you and the glucose hit yeah. of what you get because yeah. the thing uh, and they were saying that the amount of people that got um, uh, their parole passed was at the optimum after the judges have just ate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah stuff like you know what I mean? Like sixty five percent more. Then if yeah, and if they, they were having a, a glucose dip, <laughs> but it's interesting because for me it's like I, I like to tap into those resources to get my optimum creative, you know, cognitive function and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's little things like that that are kind of like knowing when to eat and when not to eat, knowing that I've got this maybe two or three hour and a half where I'm this kind of clean, total focus. Yeah, and, and it's stuff like that, knowing things like that, so actually helps it out. Have you watched um, Let It Be, uh, the Beatles doc? No, not yet. I've seen little trailers of it and stuff. Is it Let It Be? Is it yeah, yeah, the, um, or the new you, one. Get back. Oh, it's awesome. So yeah. McCartney and Lennon only only did three, four hours a day, and then and then they got either got too tired or too stoned or yeah. whatever. But that documentary, I I, I mean, you, you can see if you want to look out. Especially a collaborative process yeah. at, at the top level, you know, they were not looking at much yeah. more than two, th- three to four hours a day, and they would. I mean, Paul, Paul still says that, and then after that, everything goes a bit fuzzy. But what what was interesting about that is that they'd then go home, and they'd still be thinking about it. So it still formulate, but yeah. just wouldn't be in that sort of cauldron of Lennon yeah. McCartney and Harrison and Star. So. But that, what, what you're saying there is what's happening with you right on the board. And it, it just lets it get in your head so you can go and sit on the couch and you still formulate in your brain. It doesn't stop though, t- Tim. It's like it becomes a, um, you know, what happens to me is then, you know, kids come home, you've got a domestic life or whatever, you know, yeah. and that you, you want to be present in that time. It's, it's sometimes very difficult. But it comes back to me later on at night because I can't shut off from it. And that is an issue for me sometimes is that it doesn't stop yeah. um and you know <laughs> that's when it gets a bit interesting but so what happens then is I, I i go back to it and i stick the football on yeah whatever match is on and i feel like i'm not working but i am and i get my stuff out and i still work but because the football's on i feel like it's okay i'm still i, I am still doing something normal yeah. And I am not sort of writing and creating. But to me, the, there's a resurge of energy that comes about 7.30, 8 o'clock, yeah. which I can't ignore because, you know, if you're talking about timescales, the whole point of, you know, an industry with which you are as a business, you've got to get the thing out. Yeah. So the quicker you get it out, the, better you, the quicker you get paid, you know, so there's no point ignoring a sort of a window, of sort of three hours of doing it. The problem is, is that it's pretty hard to shut off, you know, come sort of midnight. You do eventually. So when you've got it on the board and then you've deciphered and it's, it's starting to flow a little bit for you and stuff, 
what's your next process after that after you've got it off there? So therefore, you know, you, you're working with producers and you're working with the people that pay you. So you yeah. have to then give them something physical, practical. You have to give them an outline. Do you, at any point during that process from the board to that, do you sound it with sound board at the Nicola or anything like that? Do you ask your opinion on it or...? Nicola always, I always ask her, yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, you know, she's she, she, she's the number one at what she does, so it's yeah. very, it's very handy just to say that. But what what we try not to do is, uh, you know, it could take over. Yeah. With her job and my job, yeah, it could absolutely just become everything that yeah. you talk about is is that based and I just wonder about that collaboration bit like you're saying about the Beatles and stuff because mm. like you are literally quite an introvert as a person aren't you? you are you love your own edge and love your own space yeah at what point do you soundboard it to somebody before you actually show it to somebody who's paying the bills yeah no it uh it depends who you're working with if you really trust them it, um then you can soundboard early yeah if you feel that they're constantly judging you and they just want your A game and they don't really want to, they don't have the time right. to sort of like have this batting to and forth, yeah. then you go, all right, well, I've just got to deliver what, what they want. It depends how much your employer wants to be part of the process. Right. And so you, it, it's different people by people. I mean, the, you know, the, the studios just want to earn money. You don't want to know whether you know does character A have a you know a, a huge second left testicle? Yeah, left one. It could be a right one. Depends. <laughs> depends which way you're looking, isn't it? <laughs> so you know you have to you, you have to gauge who you. I mean, it's like you with your clients. I imagine you know you, yeah. everyone's different. I imagine a lot of people yeah. different on a. Yeah, but I just before I show it them, I've gone, I've gone through about maybe five or six different people. Not even the girls through there that not necessarily in that frame I need a female's opinion yeah. before I show it to the client just so I've got you know I call it like big one thinking where everybody's in the thing but the elder makes the decision I need to get everybody's opinions before I go right this is the one that I'm going to show or this is the decision I'm going to make with the client before we see it I just wondered how you did that because obviously yeah. you're there in your own head doing your thing well unless you're unless you're generating that job so i mean there's a few ideas that i've personally put out there in the last two years which you know i want to produce and want to i want to be sort of like the the source as it were but uh, up until then everything has come to me via agents you know yeah. or you know or people wanting to work with me uh, but the next natural step is for me to put my own stories out and to have a lot more control o over it but that is then about taste factors. So, you know, we, we you know about the Sean Ryder, yeah. the Sean Ryder projects. And the problem with that is, is we've been trying to get that out. We were, we were going on it. Then, you know, COVID Which hit. Which is called Twisting My Melons. It was called Twisting My Melon. So melon is your brain. Yeah. Melons, everyone thinks is a, a pair of uh, yeah. breasts and which isn't right. So it's a Steve McQueen saying, so Steve McQueen, the actor said to a director when he was uh, probably some load of crap. What's the swearing situation here? You told it to me. All right. Well, it's been a load of bullshit to, to Steve McQueen, who's a proper movie star. He said, you know, oh, no way, man. You're twisting my melon. It's like you're twisting my head here. You're just actually talking a load of bullshit. Yeah. So that's the thing. So we, we've got to a stage where we were going to shoot and we were going to make it happen and then covid it and then i've, I've lost the, the lead actor because it, it was you know under budget for him and he's, he's doing bigger things um so it's a constant battle to get that back on board but the problem we also have with it is that everyone goes who cares you know about in the wider aspects apart from manchester yeah. and the uk who cares about sean's music or happy monday's music and i'm saying well there's a lot more people than you think but because of the industry and the people that own the purse strings of the industry, they they don't particularly think like us. Yeah. And that's the problem of getting things over the line with yeah. that aspect. So, you know, we're- So is that just on a back burner that one, so you get the right investors, the right people? It is, it's- I mean, if you're not into the Manchester scene and stuff, obviously an investor from America's not even gonna understand what the fuck we're on about. Exactly, and exactly. to get that on board, but- 
But what you, what I always do with these musical sort of orientated dramas is say, right, well, drain drain the music out of it, and what have you got, yeah. right? You know, it's not, and, yeah. and, and with Sean's story, it's definitely a father-son story. Yeah. It's his relationship with Derek, who became the roadie of, of him and the Happy Mondays, and Derek was wanting to be an artist in his own right, and that rivalry yeah. lasted up until Sean was 40, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's about that, it's about dysfunctional family. You know, it is about, to a certain extent, uh, a sort of... Uh, uh, a, a question questionable about if ev is everyone right for fame you know it obviously there's a there's a theme about music in there as well but you know the 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 basis of that film is a f dysfunctional family film and that's the genre that you that you say is universal because every country's got dysfunctional yeah, families yeah yeah, yeah yeah so but it's very hard to sell when you've got someone as famous as sean this is what i don't get is because everyone says yeah we know who sean is and they go well, he's not famous enough i said well listen i could have written that film without sean and it would have been a really interesting film and everyone would go yeah yeah that's yeah. really interesting but you actually got a figurehead that's to lead that into a market yeah. where you you know are people just it's just very very strange to me that but it, I, I can understand why people think it's esoteric at the same time I think it'll happen there's a lot there's, there's, there's a lot of people who want that to happen there's, there? yeah it's a couple of but it's a story of like somebody becoming famous who never thought they were famous and battling with that fame and stuff it's rags to riches as well, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, it also, it's about mental health, you know, yeah. because Sean was totally dyslexic and yeah. he's still a left field thinker. And, you know, it, 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 there's so many themes in there um, that are relevant to today. And I still think that 90s music and that 90s theme of, if you look at Levi's, they did a whole classic range based on... Yeah. Um, you know, the Happy Mondays clothes and Central Station, who, who were their designers, they'd just done it. It was like, literally like this. Everyone's wearing baggy, baggy jeans, you know what I mean? It's like, if you look at Billy Eilish, it's just, it's, it's all there. Yeah. And you look at the Asian and the Classic Nights, it's full of kids. Yeah. Take me back to Control then and Ian Curtis and then writing that script for that. So you've got it on there, you've long around it, you've read the books, you've done the research. I mean, are you like proper getting into his psyche where it's affecting your own mental health? Or are you, I mean, how deep are you going? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean every character is part of you. Yeah. You, you can't be on the outside looking in. So have you got quite sort of, um, we well, must have quite an empathetic nature where you're actually feeling sort of emotionally connected to this person that you're reading. Yeah, it yeah. becomes part of your psyche. Yeah, yeah. you know, and it, uh, totally empathetic, which is which is kind of weird because maybe that's what's made, what sometimes that makes you a bit cold in, in normal life because yeah. you, you know that as soon as you cross that line, you, you become a big softer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you have to be a big softie in, in writing characters, which is probably good for me because it means that I can get that out of my system in, in, a, in a creative way rather than on, a, on an everyday way, which, you know, I'll probably get, end up joining some kind of missionary. Oh, that. That, yeah, that, what was that thing with Levi? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was really. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, won't mind that one though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you're actually writing that, getting into his thing, and then you ju you start writing out the script. Then, so therefore, you have to get into the structure, and, and you know the obvious one is the three act structure uh, to make it uh, industry standard. Yeah, and you know there's this sort of like breaking into two catalysts. Uh, there's certain points within that midpoint, you know. The, the, there are points within the script that you have to hit as a as a as a dramatic moment. Yeah, I didn't know any of that. I well, mean, you're writing yeah, I didn't know any of that at all. It actually just came to me naturally, and I'm not saying that I'm just some kind of. Yeah. But I always thought, when are things getting boring? And to me, you know, a lot of films, a lot of scripts, whatever, just get boring, and it's like. It's, the, the, the main thing about story is if you cop out of wanting to know what happens next, then you are not in the story, yeah? And for me, that's a personal thing. So everything I do, I go, right, do I want to know what happens next here? If I don't, then, 
you know, make it happen. And I think that has always served me well to naturally be able to construct a, a narrative or a film or a movie or, or a, you know, an outline for a movie that makes me feel I'm interested here. Therefore, hopefully an audience will be. But you do get people that are just, you know, totally different to me. And, and therefore, you know, things can drag in my... How much did writing for City Life benefit you, writing for Control? Uh, did you get anything from writing for the, the nightclub scene? Now? Yeah, I got loads from it. A free entry and a few free drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't think I got any girlfriends out of it because none of them believe me. Uh, I got chucked out of a few because because <laughs> no one would let me in because I was a seventeen and underage. Is that what you were at the time? Yeah, yeah. I remember going to Mum Rose in Stockport, <laughs> Mum Rose, and uh, they just looked at me because I had trainers on and jeans and just went, "No, not tonight." I said, "Listen, I'm here to, to review your club." Anyway, no, there's a few that I'd travelled to. There was one up here, actually, in uh, Farmworth. What was it called? It wasn't... It wasn't... It was. It, there was a mad one in Farmworth as well. But I got into that one. Um, the, the thing about City Life and writing, well, what, what it did is it reignited my... Uh, it, when I got to that stage at Ollie Oates and Mersey TV, when I was behind the camera, you know, sort of making tea... I actually remembered that I could write and I'd tried to make it as a writer at an early age, you know, in a, in a creative sort of re nightclub review. I wrote for Mixmag as well, you know what I mean? I'd, it did get out there a little bit uh, and I'd forgotten about that talent. And I think if, I'd had, if I had not written for City Life, I wouldn't have remembered when I was about 28, 29 that I used to write. You used to love writing. Yeah, right. yeah. And so, th therefore, I think I would have probably just progressed in a production way yeah. in TV. So I'd become like a, a line producer or a producer. I wouldn't have become a writer. So City Life was integral for me to, to sort of remember. Can you remember the point where you wanted to be a writer? Can you actually remember that point where the, this is what I really want to do it? Uh, the only thing I could do at school was not not particularly right because I think I, you know my son's very dyslexic and, and I think I was as well. It takes me ages to read things, but the only thing I was good at was story. You know, thinking about uh, composition uh, and not comprehension, composition, yeah. and how you know I'm making stuff up and characters that were very vibrant in my head. The hard thing was getting it down on paper. Yeah. So as far as, you know, there was two two times I wanted to be a writer. Was one I came out of Loretto College in, in um, Hume, and I went, I want to be on the scene. I want to be on the dance, I want to be on the race, dance music scene, because that's where I was. I want to be someone, how do I do it? I can't make music, can't DJ, can't dance. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can take loads of ease, everyone yeah. could, you know what I mean? But and I mean how do I be someone? And it was then I went, Well I can write, so let me try and get into City Life because they were doing the, the, the reviews at the time. And was so, that before Hass that? No, no, that was Just that at the same time. That was definitely sort of eighty eight time, eighty nine. Right. So I wrote to the City Life because there's been a book come out called uh, And God Created Manchester by Sarah Champion and she'd kind of done the, the indie side of stuff. But I said to her, I, I, went, I wrote in slagging the book off and I'd never read the book really, to be honest, saying, if you've got any openings, I write nightclub reviews. And it just so happened, right place, right time, look, again, in the same way I got the job at Hollywood, it's the same way I got the job at City Life. But I did put myself out there. I, I wrote into the editor and he wrote, he on the same letter, he just wrote on the back, said, come in and see me in the new year on the letter. So I did, I went in to see him and said, listen, I go out to nightclubs. And they were all like, not on the scene. They were all too old. Yeah. And he said, right, go out, we'll write me a review. So I ended up going to Rubinsky's in Fallowfield, <laughs> writing this review, got in, 
uh, got in, wrote a review. They took a picture of it. They really liked the review, and and then that was it. So I was kind of like buzzing around. So I did pubs and clubs. I became the nightlife editor for City Life for quite a long time, for maybe about three or four years. I was expecting to go into lifestyle editor, which was then the full time job. And then he said, "No, you you're not reliable enough." <laughs> <laughs> So Which was the best thing for me, actually, because yeah, yeah. otherwise... So how did, yeah. how did you get from there, then, into doing the Hollyoaks stuff and that? So there, after that, I was unemployed. So then it was I came out of that at 19, yeah? yeah? So I was unemployed, because I didn't get any A-levels, because obviously I went to Loretto, but didn't get any A-levels, because yeah. it was out all the time. Yeah. Uh, so I was signing on for about two years, uh, and then it, then it got to the point where I was out too much and I was thinking I need to kind of rein this in a bit I mean is there any chance of getting a degree but because I had a portfolio of work from City Life and yeah. and uh, uh, a mixed mag and, and places like that I could then went to Warrington or UCI or he was part of Chester College and, and I got on a media course there because I, I needed to get out was that media? yeah media business I mean it was a you know bullshit course in many ways but yeah. I needed some kind of. It wasn't happening with the journalism, yeah. And it, it I couldn't keep going out, <laughs> yeah. So I needed some kind of grounding. Uh, but instead of getting A levels, I had, I had a big book of, book of reviews and journalism that that got me into there. And so after that, so I went in as a mature student at twenty one, came out at twenty four, and that's when that opening came up. And I literally turned up. Uh, yeah, I tell you, I tell you, I turned up pissed. I went out the night before at Discotheque Royale. <laughs> so I had, I, I had, I had the biggest interview in my life, right? Mersey TV, where Brookside's filmed and all that. Yeah. Just pissed. It was some pills as well. Uh, I was out with Millsy, so it probably was pills. Yeah, yeah. So, Mick Mills. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we were out. It was like something like a. You know, it was like student night, Wednesday night, Disc Attack Royale said, listen, do not, I've got this most important interview in my life, do not keep me out anyway. I wake up, I'm still at home in Presswich at this time, I'm, I'm still at home, I wake up at the time I'm supposed to be in Liverpool. You know, you know what I mean? It's just that, <gasps> Mom. straight on the phone, uh, yeah, the exhaust has dropped off from the motorway. <laughs> you know, in the car. And I can't believe that they took it. I just dive into the car, drive up, and I'm, must be reeking. Must be absolutely reeking. Again, but because I'm still pissed, I'm dead cocky, right? So I go, I walk into this room, and they must have been desperate for a runner or a tea boy, they must yeah. have. But I, I'm quite cocky, I'm going, yeah, yeah, well, whatever you want to do. And I must have made an effect. So anyway, I'm driving home, and I'm, I'm sort of two hours late for the interview. I'm pissed. I get the job. <laughs> and I never look back since. So, I I mean, to me, that is probably the maddest moment. If you look at the at the sort of, the variables of life. Because if it wasn't, you yeah, get into that. That sliding doors yeah, yeah, yeah. moment. Yeah. And the way that it happened in such a crazy way. But at the same time, you know, I was always pushing to sort of be in the creative industries and and I don't know, yeah, I feel very, very, very lucky from that moment. Yeah. Because it so easily they could have said, No, don't bother coming in or, you know, no, you stink of booze. <laughs> no. But they didn't. They gave me that job, and 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 that is the catalyst for for everything that's happened since. So, you've done that. Then obviously you got these. What did it feel like when somebody said we write the screenplay for Control? Was that's like from where you were? So that's like quite a big. Yeah. No. That was that was massive, and I tend not to try and overthink that. Because wow. because one writing a movie is totally different to writing a, a, a TV script. Yeah. Because you're writing double. Yeah. So it's it's twice as hard. Yeah. Um, and two, because of the the way of the expectation of, of Ian, which I was aware of, you know, and, and Joy Division. 
Yeah. And, and, and three, I was about then to go and meet my hero's new order because then I had to meet them as part of the research project. And I got going, oh my God, wow. what, what is this? Now, now I'm in the same room as them and they're looking at me and saying, you're in charge of Ian's, Ian's legacy as far as a movie's concerned. Yeah. And you're just going, okay, no pressure. And, but it is all pressure. But I think what you then do is you retreat, or what I do is retreat into my own mind and just say, you know, that that's, you can't be doing it for anybody else. You have to do it for you and for what what's within you. Uh, and if it's not good enough, it's not good enough. At that moment in time, I wasn't thinking if it's not good enough for them. I, I was actually thinking about everybody else. I've learned that isn't the healthiest way. What do you mean by that? Give me that. I don't, I don't think I've ever thought about that before. If like stuff that I'm doing is it for me or is it for the other person? Yeah, and uh, yeah, and it's a difficult one. But now I've realised. I mean, I'm fortunate in things that I do. I want to do them for me, sort of creatively. I'm not having to, you know, go right fucking Coronation Street or whatever to pay bills or yeah. Holly. I, mean, I love Holly Oaks, by the way. No, I want to say I say Emmerdale, but but so everything I do is a personal choice you know, of, of creativity. But in the early days, you were thinking, what do they, th what are they going to think of it? And, and, and how are they going to react? And, you know, what's this person, um, are they, are they going to like it? And in the end, I've, I've realised that's, that's something that, that's not the road you should go down. And really, the only way you're going to like it is to cut that out and actually start from within and understand the reasons why you're doing it in the first place. And therefore you, you should get a better, you should get a better script or a, or a better piece of art or, or something that comes out of you because you're not being um, sidetracked by other people's opinions that you can't change until you get something out that you think is good enough. That's really good, that, mate. <laughs> is that deep man is that like yeah, if, well, that's what I'm just thinking to myself because I'm thinking did you do you think Control wouldn't have been the film it is today if you would have been a fanboy because I, I feel that maybe you going on that journey and reading that book has actually given you a better insight than actually being a fanboy from the outside I think totally in a, you know in, this, in, in the same way I mean with John of course I was a fan but I I wasn't a fanboy because John was a different era, John Lennon, yeah. and it, so therefore you're still researching and, and trying to understand his life because it it, it wasn't out there, and, and if you were trying to write it sort of twenty in the eighties, you you wouldn't have the amount of research that you you've got at your fingertips today. So everything is a journey, sort of mentally first, you know, sort of yeah. sort of within rather than without, and I think that 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 in, internal journey. Is key, you know. I mean, apart as as far as sort of as knowing if you feel it, and not enough is. I mean, we're in we we kind of live in a world, I think, at the moment where everything is is pretty much can be surface. Yeah. And you know, with with social media, which I'm not on, um, and I, I think internal journeys. And, and, and honesty within sometimes maybe neglected but for me it's an integral part which is why I'm, I'm you know the, those surface sort of platforms not not that they don't do help for other people but it doesn't help me creatively yeah. so from writing Control and Ian and moving on to Nowhere Boy and John writing about John Lennon what have you learned from writing about that that you that help you write this? Because obviously with Ian, you've not really got an outside perspective apart from, look, this is my band, I'm not following all stone roses every Monday, you know what I mean? You're either one or the other kind of thing. Mm. What has changed now because you've got mm. like a, an almost a bit of a, an idea of who John Lennon is and stuff like that, how do you go about writing something like that? Well, with John, I mean, I mean, it's a massive leap from me into John because John is, you know, after Muhammad Ali, is probably yeah. the most, Know, famous person or especially of, of the last generation I'm not sure about this generation but you know he, he 
he is such a, a massive icon. So to be given that mantle again, you go, wow, that's heavy. You know, how do you be able, are, are you able to sort of tell that story? But the, the good thing about that was I wasn't telling his Beatles story to the extent of when they became massive and popular. I was talking about John as a kid. And then that was a story that wasn't told. So therefore the expectations of, you know, you're not, you're not seeing them at, at Shea Stadium and all that was, was a lot easier. So and there was an untold story there about his relationship with his mother because he lived with Aunt Mimi. Um, and his mother lived around the corner, but he didn't know. And his dad left him, at, you know, when he was four and all that, which were all these kind of, I didn't know that. It was just an insight into, and most stories, you know, are good when you don't know them. And I think this was the untold story of John Lennon, which allowed me to be more, you know, sort of internalise it better because not everyone knew about it. Whereas if it was about, you know, help and, and, and them at the apex, it, it would be very difficult. And I think, you know, that's why that film probably hasn't been made. You know, because there's so much footage about there. I mean, how do you recreate that? Yeah. But John, as a kid, it was a lot easier. So, when you've done with the writing on each one of them, and, the, and it comes to actually doing the filming process and stuff, are you actually there on set? What's your sort of role when you get when you get there on set? Well, it's a, it depends on who the, who the director is. Yeah. I mean, and some directors are very collaborative, and some aren't. And and some don't want you there because you can create problems for them. Yeah. Because it's all about, uh, you know, it's all about uh, interpretation, right? So, you know, Debbie's book about Ian came out. That was her interpretation and that. Then I interpret interpret it with a script. Then the director interprets it, and then the actor, inter and then the editor bloody. So it goes down that line of interpretation, yeah. and sometimes you know you've got to be careful of how many, how how many times you do that, and and people are, and directors more than most people are very very sensitive about their interpretation because that's, let's face it, is kind of the most important one. Yeah because that's the one that gets them on screen and because they can now tell the tell the actors how to interpret it so uh well as far as collaboration is concerned it all depends on how secure the director is in their own mind yeah. and, and their own uh sort of way of being and and, and there's definitely more secure <laughs> directors uh than than others because some directors are absolutely total you know wackos yeah so a lot of ego and stuff like my way the highway no but even yeah absolutely yeah. I, I don't know they're probably you know serial killers if they weren't directors <laughs> <laughs> what's out of everything that you've done what's what's been the most rewarding bit for you out of everything that you've done that you just kind of look at back now and you just kind of city life you know i mean uh, because without it it wouldn't have, it, it not it mm. wouldn't have happened city life doing those nightclub views, I look back on it and, you know, just bobbing around town, a lot of the time on my own. And as, as you said before, I'm an introvert. Yeah. So, you know, going into nightclubs, uh, sort of like 12 o'clock on your own and then doing, you're doing, an, doing a review and, and that's in, yeah, it's you, you, yeah, you couldn't do that now yeah. as, as a sort of, you know, 49 year old, you know, mm. imagine me trying to go into a club and write, and <laughs> I think I'd get nicked. <laughs> You know what I mean? But yeah. I did it because there was a scene going on and, yeah. and, and no one seemed to, to, to find it imposing. Uh, and the music and the dancing and also, you know, sort of drugs. And it was all, it was a perfect storm mm. for an introvert because you could lose yourself on a dance floor and you didn't particularly need loads of mates, even though, because it, it was a very inclusive scene. Mm. You know, you, the, and, then it, and then it got obviously really nasty. But it, I, I just look back at that and go, wow, well done you. Yeah, you you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, well done for putting yourself in that situation. Well done for writing those reviews. I've got a few of them in that book. I haven't got all of them. And there's a guy that I know 
that has got them all because he used to be assistant editor there. And I'm gonna go and um, I'm gonna go and scan them all, and I, I'm gonna put them on. I'm gonna give them to kids because I think to me that if you're talking about a movie catalyst, if you're gonna do my life story, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do because you know I'd have me me youth. You'd understand where I came from, but the what kicked me on was getting that and getting out there and writing because without that. Ten years later at Ollie Oaks, I would have gone. I've never written before. Why would I write now? If you were going to give advice to somebody who wants to get into screenwriting, directing, like a like teenager or young, what what advice would you give them? Read loads of scripts. Right. Where can you get scripts from? There's loads of there's loads of internet. internet. Scriptorama. Yeah. yeah. You, most scripts are published now. To to the internet because there's no there's no reason it actually promotes the film. You know what I mean? It's not like it's like a trailer now. If you can read the scripts, I got me some of the James Bond one the other day. And I think once because the professional industry needs you to format it professionally, I, I think you might have as, as much talent in the world, but unless yeah. you actually are able to put it down and format it properly, yeah. And people will just think you're a student, yeah. So if you want to get ahead of the game, get Final Draft, which is the industry standard. Get Final Draft. Learn how to use it. Learn how to, you know, deliver a script or let someone print it out and let, let them think you're a professional. I mean, understand the rules before you break them. That's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There are those rules, and yeah. they're definitely there. The great thing about my job is that it still comes from the script. Yeah. We've not been bypassed by technology. It means me inputting in script, but as far as formatting is concerned, you've got to be able to do it. Yeah. Because they'll sniff you out. You know, if, if there's a script that does not look professional, right, it's gone. It's that cutthroat, and it's getting more cutthroat. Yeah. Then I would say after that, um, you know, look at your favourite films. Get your, get your favourite film script, learn them off by art, write them out again, yeah? Imbibe them, So because you've already got a relationship with those films. So let that kind of inspire you to what you want to do, but learn those basics first. And then as far as, um, you know, writing something, then, then, then you go out and try and find an original idea and do it. Got to write. It's like the professional sort of tennis player, golf player, football player, it's 10,000 hours or whatever it is, 10 million hours mm -hmm. that you've got to do it. You can't not, if you, if you just expect to turn up and write a script and someone to go, okay, that's, that's three million quid, it ain't gonna happen. You gotta write, you gotta fail, you gotta fail again and keep failing, failing, failing. And I've said to you before, you know, I would say 50, 60% of my stuff hasn't been made. But it's all been a help. It's also also character building as well because it's a tough, tough. I can't say really tougher tough. industry. You will get chucked out yeah. without a doubt, and uh, you know, especially if you, the the higher you go up, the more money it takes to to produce your stuff. Cause yeah. Then you know, I mean, the, the, it's ruthless, and I, I, I'm sure everyone knows about the Hollywood sort of the, the Hollywood game, people come out of that ruined and, and a lot of people do. I think that's it, Matt. But what we need to do is you need once you've done this next project and it's been done, you need to come back and talk about it. The next. big so one. I'm excited <laughs> about this one. Yeah, the big one, yeah. Mate, appreciate your time. Yeah. Hope it's helped some people out and got a bit of an insight what goes into a screenwriter director's head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it, it's very difficult to to sort of get that out there, what happens within. I mean, I think for a creative mind, sometimes you, you, it all happens within and therefore it's very hard to speak about it. I'm not sure I'd be able to have done this 10 years ago, to be yeah. honest. I think it, it's only through experience that I'm now coming out and yeah. being able to vocalise. Yeah, it's just, I think, you know, I just, I just say to people, you've got to find your own way of doing it like you do, because it's so interesting when I see great people like yourself and they're like, they're all, you, 
the creep person's so insular, they're so introverted in their own head and stuff, you've got to find your way of doing it and how, you know, like your way's sort of different to mine and everybody's got to find their own way. So I just, I'm hoping it helps some people out when they're coming up with designs or they're coming up with, you know, do it your way. Well, the great that, thing about you, Tim, flow, man. good thing about you, Tim, is that you created an environment which absolutely works for you, you yeah. know, and, and you, you know, it's also a business yeah. it works as well because yeah. let's face it, you got to get paid. Yeah. And it's all right just saying, you know, I've got an idea there and there and everywhere, but you yeah. have to, you have to go from beginning to end in order for your clients to come back, yeah. you know, in order to get paid, to pay one and to pay yourself. And if yeah. it, you have to move beyond the sort of student way of thinking about creativity and, and bring a whole new different level of, you know, business acumen into the game. Yeah. But of course you've got to start with you've got to be creative in the first yeah. place. Well that's that's why my logo looks like the way it does. It's like it's I do kind of out the box thinking, but for it to work I've got to bring it back to the box. That's what makes the money. It's alright doing all this fluffy airy stuff, but if it's got no strategy on what's it to it, it's not gonna make any money. So Well no, no. Yeah, yeah. It's like me, I mean, I'm not going to go and write some student short films again and, and not yeah. make any money. I mean, I mean, that's the burn will sit up, by the way, mate. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah. well, if anybody but, needs to go to Matt's site, mattgreenhouse.co.uk, look at the shorts and look at Acid Burn because that is, um, yeah, he started off on my what is this? And then <laughs> he, he kind of just like takes on this lovely little journey, but I love that one, it's yeah. so cool. But it's all about, you know. You uh, taking those of magic mushrooms yeah, yeah, and yeah. tripping your tits off. So if you're into yeah. that, <laughs> that's the one for you. Right, thanks so much, mate. Appreciate it. No. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye. <laughs>